is Blake on religion. William Blake was born in England in 1757 and died there 70 years later, 1827. Blake never went to school and yet today anyone familiar with the English language if asked to make a list of the six greatest users of the tongue, could not, if he's familiar with the language, he could not omit the name of Blake in any list of six. I asked that question of Aldous Huxley about five or six years ago. And he said to me, just what I've just said to you, that no one familiar with English literature, all the way back to Chaucer, Chaucer, Spencer, Milton, Shakespeare, you might alter the list somewhat, but he said no one could omit the name of Blake in any list of six of the greatest users of the English town. And he never saw the inside of a school. He taught himself Hebrew, Greek, Italian, and of course he was the master of the English town. He had his visions from the time he was a child. And when he died, he was still communing with the world of eternity, really. He was singing hymns and he said, they're not mine. They belong to those in eternity. They're not really mine. He said of religion, I know of no other Christianity and of no other gospel other than the liberty both of body and mind to exercise the divine arts of imagination. Imagination, the real and eternal world of which this vegetable universe is but a faint shadow and into which we shall go in our eternal or imaginative bodies when these vegetable mortal bodies are no more. There's no one who has given more to this world concerning the secret of imagining than Blake, unless of course we speak of the Bible. For the Bible to him was pure vision from beginning to end. It was his textbook. And so he asked this very prominent man of the day, why is it that the Bible is more entertaining and instructive than any other book. And then he answered the man, is it not because it is addressed to the imagination which is spiritual sensation and only immediately to the understanding or reason? So to him the book was pure revelation, God's word. He wrote what he considered the grandest poem in the world. Jerusalem. He said, I may praise it because I am only the secretary. Its authors are in eternity. Here, in a very short period of time, Blake completed this grand poem. He said it was dictated to me, sometimes twelve, sometimes twenty, and thirty verses, not verses, but lines at a time. So here, a work that should have taken a lifetime of labor came without labor in so short a period of time. And he starts in the beginning and he states the theme before he allows the dictation. And the theme is stated in the very first two lines. Of the sleep of Alva, Alva is this world, and of the passage through eternal death and of the awakening to eternal life. Then said he, this theme calls me night after night in sleep, and every morn awakes me at sunrise. Then I see the spirit of my Savior hovering over me and dictating the words of this mild song. The spirit of love, his Savior, hovering and dictating twelve, twenty, thirty lines at a time. And then the dictation begins with an appeal to man. Awake, awake, O sleeper, 
of the land of shadows. Wake, expand, I am in you, and you in me, mutual in love divine. But then said he, the perturbed man, a way turns down the valley's dark. He can't believe it. A man imputes sin and righteousness to individuals and not to states. To understand Blake, you've got to draw a line of demarcation between the individual, the immortal you, and the state, the present state of that individual. He said, as the problem passes, while the country permanent remains, so men pass on, but states remain permanent forever. So we must distinguish between the state and the individual occupying that state to understand Blake. He said, all that you behold, though it appears without, it is within, in your imagination, of which this world of mortality is but a shadow. And he constantly reminds the reader never to condemn anyone in this world. For, said he, I do not consider the just or the wicked to be in a supreme state, but to be states of the sleep which the soul may fall into in its deadly dreams of good and evil. So come, Lord Jesus, said he, and create states to deliver man evermore. So you see someone who is not feeling well, maybe he's up against it financially, maybe things aren't going as they ought to go, that's a state. If you know the difference between the individual in that state and a former state or a future state that you can create, you can lift him out of it by representing that individual to yourself as you would like to see him and put him in that state. Do it without his knowledge, do it without his consent. You can do it. You can create a state and pull people out of horrible states into lovely states. Lead them in the lovely state and they will simply occupy it beautifully. And today it will be the only state, the only real thing is what they're in at the moment when you pull them into it. And he shows us how to do it. He said, I have fourfold vision seen. And a fourfold vision is given to me. It is fourfold in my supreme delight. And threefold in soft, viewless night. His twofold always may God us keep from single vision and mutant sleep. Single vision to him was simply the ordinary physical sight, where this is what it appears to be and nothing more. Double vision is where everything is but a symbol. I told you the story the morning I opened of a little girl five years old. Well, her little sister, who was three this past year, taken to the beach by her grandmother. In the beach, or out on the sea, were piles driven into the sand, marking some bunker. And she turns to the grandmother and she said, Grandma, look, sticks bathing. Well, it struck the mother thoroughly, the grandmother, and she recorded it and told me about it. But this little child, not yet painted with the adult mind, saw sticks bathing. They were not simply piles in the sand, unsightly, not to her. She rejoiced and wished at the moment she were a stick, and out in that water bathing with the sticks, because to them, or to the little mind, she endowed the sticks with animation, with something alive, and they were bathing. That's double vision. And he speaks of it to my outward eye, it's an O, it is simply a pebble or a thistle along the way. But with my inward eye, it's an old man gray. He looked at a flower, he saw a flower with the outer eye, and with the inner eye, he saw something entirely different. Don't you practice that? You look at something along the way, and you see it entirely differently. He said, I went to the heath and the wild, to the thorns and the thistles of the way. And they told me how they were beguiled, driven out, and then compelled compel to be chased, as he called it. Here things were, to the outward eye, a thistle and a thorn. And he communed with the thistle and the thorn. And they spoke to him and told him that they were simply the embodiment of the suppressed longings of the normal longings of the human heart. He communed with them and they spoke to him. 
All this was double vision. Now, threefold vision, you must practice. Practice it tonight. Everyone must or should practice it. What the little girl did, that's threefold vision. She imagine herself in a living room with all glass walls. That's an image. The room is an image. And she is an image. The mother is an image. And all that she did, she blended and intermingled images. She married them. And then they produced offspring. The offspring was the result in the world where the home was bought by her father. She did not consult the father. She simply took her mother into her confidence and together they played the part. And then the father had a change of jobs, increased income, and he bought the home. So that is threefold vision. If I bring you into my mind's eye and represent you to myself as I would like to see you and persuade myself of the reality of this imaginal act of mine, that's threefold vision. What does it imply? But it implies good fortune for you. So I'm doing something which would imply something else. That which is implying is the offspring of my image. I bring you, put an expression on your face, I listen to words coming from you where you tell me how well things are going for you. All this imagery, I intermingle and blend it and marry it and then it produces the result I am looking for. The result is the offspring of this blending of images. That's threefold vision. Fourfold vision, whether you've had it or not, I do not know. I will share with you an experience. I've had it time and again. But here is one, I think I've told you this before, but it lends itself to this vision, and so I want to share it with you. Many years ago in Beverly Hills, four in the morning, I'm on my right side, and I know that what I am seeing, I should not see. But with my eyes open, I should see a little tiny bureau and a picture on it, and on the wall above it, just a small little picture. But I should not see what I'm seeing. I am seeing the interior of a very lush and plush hotel. I am seeing it as vividly and more so than I'm seeing you now. And yet, yet I know where I am. I'm on my bed. It's in Beverly Hills, on El Camino. I'm on my right side. I can feel all this. And I should not be seeing what I'm seeing. But I am seeing it, and I can't deny it. So, consciousness follows vision. And I, I walk in to my image. And the image is just as real as this room. I remembered where the body was. So I returned to the body. Returning to the body, I'm once more in a horizontal position. Consciousness again follows vision, and I am now in a vertical position. I step right into this interior. I came back and went forward, back and forth, about a dozen times. Then I said to myself, I am going to venture. Regardless of the consequences, I am going to venture. With that decision made, I stepped into the interior, and then it closed around me. I am actually the occupant of the image. And the room is just as solid as this room. But I am shut out. There is no way back to Beverly Hills and Earth and that body on the bed. Here I am in an entirely different world, but the world is solid. I touch the bureau and it's solid. I touch the walls and they're solid. Then I thought, well now I'll explore. I'm here for this purpose. So I came out of this room as it closed around me. And I came into a large passageway, which led down to another hallway. I walked to the end. And then as I got there, it was quite well lit, and I saw two ladies walking by. And as they started by, I spoke to them, and I said, ladies, this is a dream, you know. And they were afraid, as any lady would be afraid if a total stranger met them in a public hallway and told them that this is a dream, I know you would be afraid. And so they either thought they were in the presence of a mad person or something, but they were startled. But that world was so solid, they couldn't go through the wall. They wished they could, but they couldn't. It's a real world. Then I looked up, and I noticed over my head a peculiar ornament. I had seen a similar one in Northcote, Hollywood, in a friend's home. At the time, I asked him, how does this thing remain up? And he said to me, if you look closely, you will notice an almost, but not quite, an almost invisible thread and is anchored to the ceiling by that almost invisible thread. It gives the illusion of floating. It was a copper thing, very lightly done, beautiful leaves, but a very large picture. 
And so I thought, well, now this is only a memory image of what I saw in Hollywood. So this I know is gossamer. So I put my hand on it, and I say to the ladies, I'll show you ladies, and I really thought that when I touched it, it would disappear. As I held it, it was solidly real, just like this. I then said to myself, now Neville, you know exactly how this thing happened. Your body is in Beverly Hills on a bed. Your wife is in that bed. It's a double bed. That house is on El Camino, and that's in the state of California, and California is in America. This is a dream. You know it's a dream. You know exactly how the whole thing started. You saw, while on the bed, what you should not have seen, and you ventured. You stepped into your image, and the image became real, as real as it is now to you. So wake up. And I said to myself, come on, wake up. And I actually felt myself waking, as it were, coming to you. And I'm waking, fully awake, and I'm standing in that hallway. And no possibility of return. There's no road back. And I say to myself, now you know this is stupid. You have unfinished business on earth. You have a child not yet educated. She's in high school, and she has the ambition and the talent to go to college. And so, it is unfinished business. When you, tomorrow morning your wife will wake, and the body will be dead. You'll have to perform an autopsy because you weren't ill, and they're going to bring in some kind of a verdict, but whatever the verdict is, you're dead. And here you are, fully alive, in an entirely different world. So standing there, I shut my eyes, and, as would happen to anyone else, I couldn't see anything with my lids closed. I open my lids, and here I'm still in this room this hallway. I did it several times, and then I decided to try something that once before succeeded in bringing me back, and that was the sense of touch. That's why I know beyond all doubt that Blake was quite right when he said, imagination is spiritual sensation. So standing vertically, I assumed that my head was on a pillow. I simply assumed it, and imagined the sensation that I would feel were it true and I could feel a pillow. And strangely enough, on feeling a pillow, I had the sensation of being now on a horizontal uh, level, not vertical. And then I could feel the pillow. And I said to myself, well, at least I'm back. But I'm cataleptic. I could not move my body. I couldn't move any part of it. In about, say, 20 seconds, I could, with tremendous effort, move this little thing on my left hand. A little while later, I could move it from the elbow. As I got that motion, I pushed it out, and I felt to my wife's body. I knew then I was back, but I couldn't open my lids. My eyes were actually sealed. Then maybe another 15, 25 seconds, with tremendous effort, I got the eye open, and here are the familiar objects on the wall. The little picture on the bureau, the bureau, and I'm back. Then I could begin to really move it, and then return to normalcy. That's fourfold vision. When you're seated in a chair, and you see what you shouldn't see. Not the familiar objects, but something entirely different. When you venture now, and step into your image, that's what he meant. If the spectator could enter into these images in his imagination, approaching them on the fiery chariot of his contemplative thought, if he could make a friend and a companion of any one of these images of wonder, then he would rise from the grave. Then he would meet the Lord in the air, and then he would be happy. That's stepping into the image, and the image takes on all the qualities of reality, just as real as this room has. And you know beyond all doubt that nothing dies. You actually see it, that nothing passes away, that the world does not come to an end where my senses cease to register it. It continues, everything continues. And then he brought out even a little sigh, a tear, a smile, a hair. Yes, even the grain of dust passes not away. Nothing passes away. But he saw the world entirely differently from the world that appears to us. I saw that world on several occasions. I've told it and shared it with you too. He said eternity exists. And all things in eternity, independent of creation, which was an act of mercy. You know what he means? Everything from the cradle to the grave that you have and will experience, as though you saw them all in individual little moments, but they aren't animated. 
that could be seen if you saw them from a higher dimension. The entire unfolding picture, not animated. Now, he makes the statement, when weary man enters his cave, he meets his saviour in the grave. Some find a female garment there, and some a male woven with clay, lest the sexual garment sweep should weave a devouring binding sheet. One dies. Alas, the living and the dead. One is slain, and one is slain. So when you enter your cave, he's speaking of the body. And you meet your saviour in the grave. This is the grave. And you actually find there, one finds my mother and my wife and my daughter, they have found female garments. I, my son, my father, we found male garments. But I am not a male, and they aren't female. When we're a man, and he capitalizes man, so man is above the organization of sex. But man entering his grave finds his savior in the grave. And then he weaves around him a female or a male garment. But he is neither female nor male. He's man. And man is above the organization of sex. So here, as we enter, we are seen. And then he said, you do not see what I see. And then he tells us what he sees in the furnaces. And then he tells us, Luba was cast into the furnaces of affliction and sealed. Well, Luba to him is love, and love is Jesus Christ. Love is God. Infinite love. You meet him right in the cave when you enter, and there you find your Savior in the grave. He said he was cast in to this grave and sealed, and he calls it furnaces of affliction. But he tells us it is for a purpose, and the purpose is to bring perfection to the individual seal with his Savior while in the grave. And he paints it so vividly, these states through which you and I must pass, and pass as a purpose. The states remain permanent, but we pass on, because we are moving from state to state to state. So here, in this poor, poor vision, and may you have it tonight, it's the thrill of thrills, a little disturbing, when you have unfinished business, I assure you. But I didn't want at that moment to leave behind a wife unprotected, a daughter uneducated. Yes, I could leave a little poor, but I didn't feel as a husband who loves her that it was equal to what I wanted to give her. And so I had unfinished business. And yet there was no way back. I'm an entirely different world. And the world is just as real as this. And I knew reason told me the body had to be discovered the next day. My body that I'm wearing seemingly is solid, but here is a body. I knew I left the body in Beverly Hills. And so I walked, I went back through feeling. I simply sensed the pillow. And so when he made the statement in his letter to Dr. Trusner, is it not spiritual sensation? Is not the Bible addressed to that in man, which is all imagination? Well, I felt it, because years before that, I too stepped into an image. I became awake in the image. As Thoreau said, real living is to be in a dream awake. When one is in a dream, awake. Well, this is a dream, and then you wake in the dream, and the dream ceases to be a dream. It's just like this. If what I did was a dream, this here is just as much a dream, I shall assure you. For that image simply became just like this room. But once before, I found myself in an image. And some object in that experience scared me. And I knew exactly how to get back to the sense of touch. And I tried a thing and it worked. If I find myself dreaming now and I know I'm dreaming, I may prolong the dream or wake in the dream to the sense of touch. And I find if I hold an object that is not movable, I wouldn't hold a cat or a dog or even a person, but I will hold a stationary thing that is seemingly inanimate, like a table or any inanimate fixed object. And when I hold it, I then say to myself, come on, wait, but don't let go. I will not let go the object, and not letting it go, I wait. I wait in the image, and the object is just as real as I knew it would be when I awake. So what is dream to us? When you're in the dream itself, it is the dream. We speak of a dream and we wake from the dream as subjective. As we reflect upon the experience, we say, well, that was a subjective experience. But it wasn't subjective when you were dreaming. It was very objective to you, the dreamer. 
is only subjective after the experience. Well, that's what he means by fourfold vision. He didn't always have it. He confessed that. He said, now I have fourfold vision, see. And a fourfold vision is given to me. It is fourfold in my supreme delight. And it is. For when you can sit quietly in a chair and leave behind you all the things of that day and step right into an entirely different world. And the world is just like this, real, and people. It's a sheer delight. Threefold vision is what you and I call upon to practice to bring about changes of stage for those we love. So you meet a person and things aren't going well, all right? It doesn't really matter. He's only in a state. So you represent him to yourself as other than what he appears to be. Persuade yourself of the reality of that imaginal act. That's another state altogether relative to him. He will conform to it. And you will meet him the next day or the next week, next month, and you will see a change in his behavior. He will conform to this blending of images in your imagination, which union creates whatever the union implies, leading one to the conclusion that causation is simply the assemblage of mental states, which occurring creates that which the assemblage implies. So you assemble images. But what do they imply? Whatever they imply, they're going to create it. So always see to it that it's going to create something lovely. For the images, when blending, if they are occurring, invariably creates what they are in implying. Anyone can do it. And you're invited to try it. That's what Blake taught. And from the time that he could breathe, he was teaching those that he met the difference between the individual and states. And begging man not to impute sin and righteousness to the individual, but to the state. He gets out of the state and he leaves behind him all of that state radiated. When he's in a state, it seems to be the only reality. When you're not in a state, it seems shadowy, a mere possibility, but not when you're in it. When you step into an image, and that image closes around you, it's real. I mean, all together, just like this room here now. And you can train yourself to step into these images and prove the being that you really are. You're not confined to the little body of five senses at all. You are a man all imagination. So when you say what seems to be is to those to whom it seems to be and is productive are the most grateful consequences to those to whom it seems to be even of despair and eternal death. But, said he, divine mercy steps beyond and redeems man in the body of Jesus. And so he steps right beyond and redeems us. We can go from state to state to state, but we cannot save ourselves. Salvation is initiated by God. It is not given to us for any good deeds done, I assure you. On the other hand, it is not given as due reward for merit, that I assure you. It is bestowed by grace alone, and then you're told in the scripture why, in virtue of his own mercy. Not because of anything I did, not because of anything you did. When you are salvaged from this world of states, the furnaces of affliction, bear in mind you didn't earn it. Not one being in the world can earn his own salvation, but it's going to be given to him by the mercy of God. And it's called in the scripture grace, pure grace, unearned, no one can earn it. And Blake saw it so clearly and told us all, in spite of all these states, glorious states, you could be pure in your own mind's eye, you could be impure in the eyes of others, but whether you were just or wicked, it was not to him anything that you could brag about, because there were only states. You fell into a state and found yourself in a pure state, and thought yourself so pure. The state was, and you, the occupant, activated it, you animated it, and it became real to you, and maybe you liked it, and remained in that state. But you could easily have fallen into another state, a wicked state. And when you are in a state, you partake of the nature of that state. And you animate it and make it all alive. But you are neither wicked nor pure. You are just this immortal being putting through, putting through the furnaces of affliction. And you pass through all these furnaces for a divine reason. To be made perfect as he is perfect. And when in his eye you are perfect, it brings you out of it. Divine mercy steps beyond and redeems man in the body of Jesus. And so all will be redeemed because you can't earn it. And Blake made it so clear. 
If you haven't read Jerusalem, what a thrill, what a treat in store for you. There are only a hundred plates, and a plate doesn't even run a full page. And so, you can really read it in an hour. Easily. Some words may be a little bit difficult to grasp, because he does involve it by calling a certain attribute loss. For well, loss is imagination. That divine being that remains faithful to vision in the time of trouble. If you turn it back, it's the sun. It really is the soul or the animating principle of everything in this world. And so when you see through his eyes, you will have to experience, I have met me. We are separated in time, but we are two figures closely woven in this tapestry of life. I met him just about a year ago, and he showed me exactly how to fall in order to see what he described so beautifully in Jerusalem. I stood perfectly still, he said, let yourself go, backwards. And so I threw myself backwards like a back dog. And I came whirling through interstellar space, as though I were a meteor. And when I, the motion was arrested, and I stood still, here I'm looking at the most wonderful being. And he seen, as I looked at him, one being. As I came close, multitudes of nations are in that being. All races, all nations. As I look closer, the heart is like glowing ruby, but it too is made up of numberless races and nations. I look still closer, and the whole body, containing all races, I'm looking at myself. Here the face is my face, and yet in that one being, all the races, all the nations are contained. I'm looking right into my own face, and my heart is glowing like ruby, but it contains all men, all women. All these bodies are in it. And it was Blake who showed me how to fall backwards in order to see the vision. And so I, I tumbled backwards, just like some medium whirling itself through space. And when arrested, that's what I saw. So although we were parted in time, he died in 1827, and I was born in 1905, so our pairs never met on earth, but in the spirit they certainly meet. And so his visions are my visions. When he said, eternity exists, and all things in eternity, independent of creation, which was an act of mercy, I'll tell you exactly what he means. For one day I stepped in, in spirit, into a room, and here, dining, family of four. Two boys in their twenties, early twenties, and father and mother. And coming through the door is a lady bearing food to the table. Through the huge big glass window, I could see birds in flight. I could see the ripple of the grass as the wind blew it. I could see leaves falling. Other diners didn't attract me, but they were diners, but they didn't attract me. The waitress attracted me, and this table of corn, that attracted me, and the other things that I've just mentioned. And at that moment, while I'm looking at the four of them, something in the depths of my soul knew that if I could arrest in me an activity that I felt, everything would freeze. I no sooner knew it than I tried it, and I felt something gel in my head. At that moment that it gelled and froze in me, everything there froze. And the waitress walking, walk not. And the diners dining, dine not. I can see the face now of the young lad. He has a spoon in his hand, he was drinking soup. And he came this far, with his mouth expecting it, and he couldn't move it. And the waitress could not walk. And the bird in flight was arrested, and it couldn't fall. And the leaves falling couldn't fall. And suddenly I'm looking at a world that is dead. Everything is dead. And where was the life of it? In me. Now a bird in flight, if arrested, should fall to the ground if the law that we speak of, of gravity, is in operation. But the bird didn't fall. And the leaves, all right, unless some other pressure equal to it, kept it alive or kept it afloat, but not the bird. The waitress, yes, if she doesn't, if she is arrested, she doesn't have to fall. But she was frozen, as though she were made of clay. They could have been made of clay. And then I released the activity that I had arrested, and I did so, each continued in their course. And the waitress walked, and he completed the action of breaking his soup. And the bird, which was perfectly still, continued the action of flight. And the leaves continued to fall. And once more, all became animated. That's what he meant. Eternity exists. And all things in eternity independent of creation, which was an act of mercy. And so we are inserted 
into this dead body, this eternal death. And then we animate it. And eventually we will come out of it with life in ourselves. Or we are told as the Father has life in himself, so he is granted the Son also to have life in himself. And the purpose of it all is to simply awaken sons who have life in themselves and not simply animated parts of the structure of the universe. One day, a lady asked me concerning animals, but I didn't know the answer. She said, Neville, what is the future evolution of the animal world? I am very fond of animals, and I hate to see them destroyed. So what is the future evolution of the animal? But I didn't know the answer. I could have given her some theory, but I could not speak then from experience. Two nights later, I find myself at the top of a ladder. And looking down, here is the jungle. Wild beast, I mean really wild. Tiger, lion, panther, everything that is really what you would call the wild beast of the jungle. And they're in an angry mood. The whole thing is moving. Strong, shabbing beast. I am alone at the top of a ladder. At the moment, I'm a little bit apprehensive and a little concerned for my own safety. And as I was concerned and apprehensive, they became all the more angry. Then in the depths of my soul, again, I knew as though something whispered, but no one whispered, I knew that they were only externalized emotions of myself. That they simply bore witness of my own emotions. When I lost all fear, they became docile, like house cats. Then I went further. As I would now repeat it, I will arrest within me the activity that makes them alive. And once more, I arrested it. And in my head in jail, I went down that entire ladder, they were made of clay. When I said clay, they were solid, just as though I walked into a museum and saw these things carved beautifully by some great sculptor. That's what they were, all dead. And then I went back up the ladder, released this activity, and once more they came into animation, and they moved, like living beasts of the jungle. So I know from experience today, the whole vast world, as Blake said, all that you behold, though it appears without, it is within in your imagination, of which this world of mortality is but a shadow. And I know it. I've experienced it. So I tell you, if you haven't experienced it, you're going to. Well, that's the purpose of being here. And you will find the whole thing is within you. It's not up there at all. I mean, if you would like me to be improved beyond what I seem to be in your eyes now, and in your own mind's, mind's eye, make me all the greater, if that's what you want for me. If you want me to come back next year bringing something far deeper than this year, see me in that light. Don't do it with my consent, do it without my consent, if that's your desire for me. If my desire for you, knowing that you may be limited, is to see you free of this limitation, without your knowledge, without your consent, I should, knowing the difference between you and states, I should create the state I want to see you express in this world, and put you in that state. So were I now to see you, as you would like to see yourself, and I remain faithful to that vision of you, I'll come back next year to encounter you in that state, or you will write me, or others would write me, to tell me of a transformed being that you seem to be. It works that way. Always bear in mind the distinction between you, the immortal you, and the state you occupy, because you know you could easily fall into the state through an argument, through a headline in the paper. You can fall into it in some other way. And think you are it, and you aren't it at all. You are the immortal being that one day will be fetched from the furnace of affliction. And being brought out, you are one with your Father, who is God. And you are He. So Blake, to me, is a spiritual giant. One of the truly awakened gods. And when you meet him, he looks like some super terrestrial being when you see him. A giant of a man, and yet he wasn't any giant there, but he was radiant. The man is radiant. Just completely awake among the gods. So when you're told in the 82nd Psalm, and God has taken his place in the divine council, in the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Blake is in the midst of the gods. When I travel now, I'm leaving here to, uh, Sunday, I take back my three books. One I brought just to show my friend freedom, the other two are my constant companions, and one is Blake, and the other is the Bible. I'll be flying to New York on the 15th of September, 
I'll be carrying two books. One will be Blake on big works, and one will be my Bible. That's all I will be carrying. It's my constant companion. First of all, the joy of reading Blake with his use of English. That fantastic use of English. All weaving in the imagination. And so no one outside of the Bible has given to the world as much as Blake when it comes to the secret of imagining. How to do it. And so these four visions of his, the fourfold, the threefold, the twofold, and the single. Well, the single is simply any normal physical sight, where its thing is what it appears to be and nothing more. That single vision. And he prayed to be saved from single vision, because everything has a meaning in God's world. I used to sit in the park years ago with my old friend Abdullah. And Ab, if two people walked by, it had meaning. It was male and female, it differed. If two men, it differed. Birds in flight. And he gave meaning to all the moving animated state of God's world. An entirely different language. God is speaking every moment of time, he said, to every one of us, but we can't see it. We do not understand the language of God. It's all spoken in symbolism, and the birds in flight reveal something to Ab. I will see Ab get up, and he wasn't so uh, superstitious. He got up at a certain moment when something passed by. He could interpret the language of God. Others couldn't. And there was reason for his getting up as time proved. He simply moved from what soon thereafter was an accident. But he moved. Everything is meaning in this world, for everything. In the very beginning of the book of John, in the beginning was the word. Well, the Greek word logos that is translated word has the meaning, meaning. So you could say, in the beginning was meaning. And meaning was with God, and meaning was God. There is a meaning, there is a purpose, a plan behind everything in this world. And eventually, you and I will understand it. But I assure you, the whole vast world, if you could arrest your power now, would stand still. Absolutely stand still. The only work outside of Blake's and one little passage in my book where I try to record the experience that I've ever seen it was in the Apocryphal New Testament of the Gospel of James. And here in the book of James, the words are put into the mouth of Joseph, the night of the birth of Christ, where he goes in search of a Hebrew midwife because he wants it for his wife. And as he starts, the heavens stood still, and the shepherds Tending their flock, they stood still. And the little lamb is drinking, stood still. And the men eating, stood still. And everything was frozen as though dead. And then suddenly, all moved on in their course. So it's the only recorded thing that I've ever heard of. And that's in the book of James, but the Apocryphal book of James. And you can get it, the Apocryphal New Testament, and look up a passage called the Infant Gospels, and look at the one under the Gospel of James. And this was the experience given as an experience of Joseph, where the night that he was born as Christ, then the heavens stood still. For that's the power that he tasted of the age to come. For that's the power you're going to wield in the age to come. And you taste it now, just glimpses of it, because you're rising into a world completely subject to your imaginative power. So if you haven't read Blake, may I beg you to get a copy and read him. You may not understand him the very first moment, but reread him. I keep on rereading him. First of all, for your, well, if you like English, just for the joy of reading good English, read Blake. Few can take words and do with words what Blake did and left to the world. So 200 years ago, he made his entrance and then left to us, although he himself was completely unknown, and you mentioned anyone in the day when he walked the earth, and they're completely unknown today. But Blake has become known, and he grows bigger and bigger every year in the eyes of those who understand the literature. And those who were considered great in his day are completely today unknown. Because the King of England in those days was simply Mad George. And we only know him today because he lost 
for which we are very thankful that he lost it, but he lost his greatest colony, which was America. And we are very grateful he did, but he was as mad as a hatter. And he's only known for that, for his madness. While Blake was not mad, but because of his visions, they called him mad and said, the man is mad because he spoke of things that mortal eyes could not see. Yet the same who called him mad would read the Bible. But well, can you conceive of the description of God on his throne as described in the sixth chapter of Isaiah? And he beheld the Lord, the Most High, sitting on his throne. Then he paints a picture. Can you conceive of any cameraman photographing it? You've got to take the words of Isaiah, because you couldn't possibly take some anonymous there and have him dissect God and his throne, and you couldn't take any cameraman who could photograph the vision of Isaiah. Was, was he mad? We have it in the book and we read it all the time. All the visions recorded in the Bible could not be photographed. And so because Blake could not photograph his own, say he could draw them, or he had the talent to draw them, but well, they called him mad. When he drew the flea, and drew the flea like a man, a monstrous man, with a neck that wasn't a neck, the head was simply stuck on shoulders. But he was trying to put over a marvelous lesson. To him, a flea is a blood-sucking insect. Well, any man who takes the life blood of another, who works him for less than a man really should be paid, he's taking his blood. He doesn't get on a man and actually suck blood. But there was a day, and there's still a day, when a man isn't paid what he's worth, and yet the man is using him. That man goes home to a wife and children that need food, need to be educated, and he's not being properly paid. Isn't he the employer of blood-sucking insect? Well, that's the flea. And what Blake made, that is, everything is man. So the little flea is only a projection of a blood-sucking man. So everyone in the world could look at that picture. It's a monstrous picture. And he drove everything into it, and he said he saw the ghost of a flea. And the ghost of the flea was man. For oh, there's nothing but man. I saw it. The animal world is simply man's emotions made visible. When man arrests in him the life that makes them alive, they all stand and are dead. The whole vast world one day will be seen by you as still. And then you know the words of Blake. Eternity exists. And all things in eternity, independent of creation, which was an act of mercy. And so we are being molded and shaped on this fabulous world of states by the uncreated God. Here the uncreated shapes himself upon the mold that is permanent. Now let us go into the silence. Good. Now, are there any questions, please? I didn't quite hear you, my dear. Yes, my dear, I'm convinced of it. That consciousness is the one and only reality, really. But the world is fixed. It really is fixed in a dead state. But the living state is your own consciousness. And you can feel it. Not just to be aware of things, you can actually feel it and stop it and start it. The day will come, you'll stop and start. Everything in this world. What the next scene is going to be, I do not know. I really do not know. But I've had glimpses of it, and I've tasted of the power of the age to be. And just as well that man in this world cannot exercise that power. Well, I saw people dining, and they seemed to be completely independent of my perception of them. They seemed to have freedom of choice in either drinking the soup or not drinking it. The waiter, or uh, that is the waitress, coming through the door, when I first came into the room, well, reason told me everything I saw was actually independent of my perception of them. But then I knew differently one second later. 
I knew that they had no life in themselves, that the life was in me. So I arrested that life in me, and they were dead. And this action would have been dead forever if I had not released that life in me. I came upon a scene that was animated and seemingly independent of my perception of it. But it wasn't, because I discovered one second later that I could arrest an activity in me and it would freeze, and it did. And the bird, as I said, the bird in flight, should a bird in flight, if arrested, the motion arrested, should it not fall, if the law of gravity is true? But it didn't. I could have held it there indefinitely, because the motion was really in me. Now one night the boy said to me, at the time I could not understand it, but the voice has never lied to me. So in the depth of my soul, a voice is speaking. You do not move in which any more than you move on your bed in sleep. It is all a movement in mind. Well, the movement in mind, I knew that I came to bed that night from the living room. I knew the next one would get out of that bed. I go to the living room, I will leave the house that day and go elsewhere, and I've done that for all these years. And the voice is telling me, you do not move in waking, any more than you move on your bed in sleep. It's all a movement of mind. You only think you move when you wake as you think you move in sleep. For then to encounter in the depths of my soul a meditating never and to discover that he is meditating me, and he is the reality that is causing the seeming motion, but he isn't moving. So was the voice speaking to that depth of my soul that is there in meditation? As Jung said, when he saw himself, he was afraid and he woke, frightened, because he said to himself, so he is the one who is meditating me. He has a dream and I am it. And then said Jung, and I knew when he awakened, I would no longer be. So a still meditating you caused 89 years of seeming motion all over this world. But the being he encountered when he was then 69 years old was there before he came from his mother's womb, meditating him. He was dreaming of an experience in three dimensions which he needed for increased awareness to further his own self-realization. But he, the meditating being, was not moving and that he was the cause of Jung's experience of 69 years, and beyond for another 20 years, where he died of 89, well then the voice is telling me the truth. For the voice wasn't speaking to this little thing here, this is the garment that I am wearing. So the voice was addressing itself to the depth of my soul. You do not move in waking any more than you move when you are bathed in sleep. It's all a movement in mind, you only think you move. When you wake as you think you move, in dream. Well, I, I recorded the words, but I couldn't understand the words. Yet, the voices never lied, lied to me. So these revelations can come beyond one's capacity to fully understand them. But you will grow into the understanding, because you will give you another experience. And another experience, and finally, it unravels itself. And you will see how true the voice was when you recorded it. As scripture, all these things were recorded in the 39 books of the Old Testament, but they were not understood any more than they are understood today. It took the New Testament to manifest the great secret hidden in the Old. And to this day there are people who will not believe that it happened. But it's all stated, but they, the very ones who recorded it couldn't understand it. They themselves confessed that the prophets sought and inquired and asked what person of time was indicated by the Spirit of Christ within them when predicting the sufferings of Christ and the consequent glory. And they were told then it was not for their time, but for ours. But they were asking and inquiring, but no voice answered their inquiry. They couldn't understand, but they recorded faithfully what the voice had dictated for our age, for our time. Any other questions, please? Yes, Bill. Did I move? In the depth of my soul, that being is still unmoved. 
but the illusion of motion I am experiencing in three dimensions with a garment that I am wearing, a male garment. I have the illusion. Now when you wake tomorrow morning from your bed, if you have a dream tonight, you will dream, you may not remember it, but if tomorrow morning you wake, remembering the dream, and the dream is very active, you'll have to confess to yourself if this thing is the real you. You really didn't move, did you? But while the dream lasted, it seemed so real, and you're certainly moving, weren't you, in the dream. But if reason enters on reflection, you'll say, well, that's all silly. I could not have moved because I went to bed here last time, and here I am in the same bed, the same room. So did I move? And you're going to tell yourself, no, you didn't, really. You just simply had a movement in mind. Or the mind did it, you'll say. But what, the mind did it, but you were clothed to yourself. You could be hurt in a dream and have the sensation of pain and witness an accident. It could even be fatal in the dream. But when you wake, it's always just the dream. Therefore, all the movements that I experienced must have been in mind. Well, when we wake from this dream, it's going to be the same thing. Or he's going to wake one day, and this on reflection will be as much a dream as tomorrow morning's reflection on the night's dream. So the point is, is all that we see or seem but a dream within a dream? Edgar Allan Poe, and he came to the conclusion, yes. Is all that we see or seem but a dream within a dream? And the day will come, that dreamer who meditated you into seeming reality, will awake from the experience which he imposed upon himself. And you will be he, but then awake, and reflecting on the experience that lasted seemingly thousands of years by our little time, will be to him just the experience of the dream that he imposed for a definite purpose, to simply further his own self-realization. And therefore you will know that you have moved. You will, you will awaken from the self-imposed stillness and dreamed of motion and all the experiences that you and I encounter in the world of flesh and blood. And you will awaken and then it will be to you like the dream of tonight will be to you tomorrow morning. But the voice is never lied to me. And when I hear it, it speaks with an authority from the very depths of the soul and you hear it and you simply listen. And you record what was told, whether you understand it or not. Then comes experiences where you can't deny the experience. The experience of seeing people stand still when I arrested an activity in me is an experience that I cannot deny. And the experience is not less vivid than the experience of today. I had a very pleasant day. I took a friend of mine to lunch today, and a friend of mine took me to dinner tonight. And they were pleasant wonderful meetings. Well, they're not any more real. Now they're memory images. The dinner is a memory image and the lunch is a memory image. But they're real when I experienced them. But they're not more vividly real in my mind's eye now than this experience of encountering diners standing still when I arrested an activity in me. That too is a memory image. But when I did it, it was as real as today's lunch was real. So in the end, that voice is going to prove itself true. For I encountered myself seated in the lotus posture. I looked at him, there is Neville, in a radiantly beautiful manner. With a character that this little Neville does not possess. There was majesty, there was strength of character, there was nobility in that face. Everything that could be desired by anyone. And yet it was Neville. And he was completely undisturbed by my staring at him. I encountered the being that is meditating me, and it is still, and it was seated in a lotus posture, completely unmoved by my interest and my surprise. And when he really moves from that sleep, I will no longer be, but I will be he. Well, we're here on Sunday morning. And that will be our last for a year, but let me repeat, it's not the last of the message, for freedom Barry is in our midst, and I think you all know it. So again, let me ask you to please take one of his cards and read it. It gives you all the information 
that you will need concerning the class. Again, thank you.